I'm Mike Wallace. This is Biography, our story, Thomas Alva Edison. We think of him now as a wizard who created a new world with the magic of the electric light, the phonograph, the motion picture. That's what history says of Edison, the inventor. But what of Edison, the man? He was remote and strange, obsessed with his work, egotistical, irreverent. He was an unpredictable genius. Edison, the wizard of Menlo Park. He was a giant in a great age of inventors like the Wright brothers, Morse, Marconi, and Bell. He was an ingenious mechanic, proud of his capable hands. Thomas Edison lived to see his work change the world. He is born in 1847 in Milan, Ohio. From the beginning, Tom is a strange child. He is withdrawn, he has virtually no playmate. Doesn't seem to want any. His father, Sam Edison, has no patience with Tom and even calls him a dunce. In school, he's a poor student. Teachers regard him as dull-witted, unresponsive. Tom's mother, Nancy Edison, finally must withdraw him from school. But she is surprised to find that, given understanding and encouragement, he displays a quick and ingenious mind. By the time he is 12 years old, Tom Edison is fascinated by gadgets, mechanics, and chemistry. A small laboratory in the basement has become his whole world. At 14, Tom becomes a newsboy on the Grand Trunk Railway. He's happy to be on his own. He is even allowed to set up his laboratory in a corner of the baggage car. Years later, the movies would recreate a famous incident from this part of his life. An accident in Tom's laboratory starts a dangerous fire. After a brutal beating by a conductor, young Tom begins to lose his hearing, and deafness drives him still deeper into the world of his imagination. Although fired from his job, Edison still spends his time around the railroad station. Tom has rescued the station master's son. And as a reward, he has made an apprentice telegrapher. Telegraph wires are following the railroad spreading across the nation. At 16, Edison leaves home and drifts from one station to another. During his seven years as a roving operator, he is constantly tinkering, trying to improve his equipment. In 1869, Edison is drawn to New York City. He is penniless, but filled with ideas for improving telegraphy. A maze of telegraph wires dominates the skyline. This is the communication center for an entire continent. In this bustling city, Edison finally gets a job as troubleshooter on a telegraph system serving Wall Street. His employer, Franklin Pope, is amazed by Edison's energy and inventiveness. He offers to form a partnership with his young employee. Edison concentrates on his invention. Pope is salesman and business manager for the new company. Edison spends his time developing a printing telegraph, a machine which converts dots and dashes into a written message. His device comes to the attention of Western Union, a giant corporation which dominates telegraphy. William Orton, president of the company, is so impressed with Edison's work that he buys his patent for the staggering sum of $40,000. Edison is so new to big business, he does not even know how to cash the check. But he will learn quickly. Two years later, the 26-year-old inventor manages to build a small factory of his own in Newark, New Jersey. He is too absorbed in his work to leave his desk, even to be photographed with his employees. In 1871, Edison marries one of his employees, Mary Stilwell. She is barely 16 and somewhat bewildered by her eccentric husband. He soon moves his young wife to a remote New Jersey farmhouse. Here she will raise three children, but her life is lonely. The hard-driving Edison is seldom at home. He works, 
and often sleeps in his new laboratories at Menlo Park. At times, he labors for 60 hours without a break. He takes Bell's original telephone and produces a vastly superior model in less than two years. Work on the telephone leads Edison to make this rough drawing. He passes it along to a mechanic, John Cruzy, with a cryptic instruction. Make this. December 6, 1877. The simple machine is completed. While his mystified employees look on, Edison fixes a sheet of tin foil to the cylinder. Then, turning the handle, he speaks a few words into the machine. Then he resets the needle and turns the handle again. The machine talks. Mary had a little lamb, its feet were quite as slow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. The voice of the phonograph makes Tom Edison instantly famous. The public is sure that there is something magical about a machine that talks. The Wizard of Menlo Park is born. At first a novelty, the phonograph eventually finds its way into front parlors around the world. It is the first product which can deliver its own commercial. I am the Edison Phonograph, created by the great wizard of the new world. It is like those who would have melody or hear music. I can sing you tender songs of love. I can give you grand opera, comic opera, or hotel. Ask the dealer. The phonograph starts the cultural revolution. For the first time, the art of the musician and entertainer is universally available. agrees with Edison. In a mood of exhilaration, he makes a startling prediction. His next invention, he says, will be a practical system of electric lighting for use in the home. The problem has preoccupied other inventors for years, but Edison is confident that he will succeed. When it's known how I have accomplished my object, says Edison, everyone will wonder why they never thought of it. But after his initial enthusiasm, Edison realizes that his task will be much harder than he had imagined. The public expects results in a few weeks, but months and then years drag by while the wizard of Menlo Park finds his magic elusive. Edison's key problem is finding a material which will burn brightly inside a vacuum for a long period of time. After testing almost every substance known to man, Edison stumbled on a common material, carbonized paper. This is the answer. Edison takes his electric light to New York. My work in the laboratory is done, he announced. My light is perfected. I'm now going into the practical production of it. Edison has a light bulb, but now generators, conductors, insulators must be conceived and constructed. It's an enormous job that drags on for three years. The public doubts that Edison will ever fulfill his boast. Finally, Monday, September 4th, 1882. In a 
short time, millions of people are living in the soft glow of the Edison lamp. But his scientific triumph is marred by a personal tragedy. His wife has died, and he is left with three children who hardly know him. He is a lonely man. Then he meets Minna Miller, the daughter of an Ohio minister. The middle-aged Edison falls in love with all the romantic intensity of a teenager. He builds this house in Florida for his honeymoon. In a burst of sentimentality, he makes an unusual entry in his diary. He writes, Here the perfumed zephyrs forever kiss the gorgeous floor. Then, embarrassed, he adds a footnote. Rats. Edison works at his laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey. Here, he confidently predicts, inventions that formerly took months can now be done in a few days. Then Edison enters a new field in a big way. In the New Jersey backwoods, he builds a revolutionary plant for refining iron ore on a mass production basis. Rival companies panic, their stocks tumble. A shaken industry waits for news of Edison's success. In the midst of all this activity, Edison files patents for a device which he considers trivial. It makes photographs appear to move. A later model, the kinetoscope, uses strips of photographs printed on pliable film. In this tar paper studio called the Black Mariah, Edison photographs a few short films for commercial exhibition. In kinetoscope parlors, cousins of the Penny Arcade, the public happily pays a nickel to catch a glimpse of the moving photograph. Some subjects are ordinary. Others portray life with daring frankness. From the beginning, the movies are a sensation. The public flocks to see magic even more amazing than the phonograph. Moving pictures are now projected on a screen for large audiences. But while Edison earns nickels in the city, he is losing a fortune in his mining project. Nothing seems to go well. There are costly errors, tragic accidents. Then the price of ore plunges with the discovery of rich new iron deposits in Minnesota. And Edison's ore plant is useless. Nine years of work and two million dollars are wasted. He is near bankruptcy. But far worse, for the first time in his life, Thomas Edison has failed. After bitter financial failure, Thomas Edison is soon lifted from despair by the unexpected success of his kinetoscope. The movies rapidly become America's favorite entertainment. Edison admits he is a little shocked by the popularity of what he calls this champion time waster. Edison becomes a favorite subject. He is filmed during World War I while he serves as president of a board of scientific advisors to the Navy. But he is disappointed by official reaction to his suggestion. 
I made 45 inventions during the war, he complained. But the government pigeonholed every damn one of them. Now in his 70s, Edison still puts in a full day at his laboratory. The West Orange labs have become a sprawling enterprise, a kind of factory for research and invention. But Edison refuses to become an impersonal administrator. In the freewheeling spirit of the old Menlo Park days, he tries to keep his finger in every pie. The Edison phonograph remains under his direct control. In spite of his partial deafness, he even insists on personally selecting the music that will be issued under the Edison label. The aging Edison is welcomed as a distinguished observer in the great electrical plants that his genius has created. While intrigued by new developments, he sometimes feels a little annoyed that all scientific progress is not made in his own laboratory. He has created employment for hundreds of thousands of men and women, but ironically it is the kind of routine, undemanding work that he himself has always hated. He pays a formal visit to Charles Steinmetz, the famous master of electrical theory. There was a time when Edison could safely make fun of ivory tower theory. But now, men like Steinmetz are the new leaders in research and invention. Edison feels more at home with what he calls practical men, like automaker Henry Ford. These old friends have much in common. A love for machines, devotion to work, and strangely, a liking for life in the great outdoors. The famous naturalist John Burroughs leads Edison, Ford, and their friend Harvey Firestone, the tire millionaire, on camping trips. Edison has a wonderful time. He enjoys a carefree boyhood. This party of amateur Boy Scouts enjoys roughing it. But the comforts of home are not far behind them, carried by a caravan of Ford trucks. Leisure has been a stranger to Edison for most of his life. Now he meets it head on and finds it isn't so bad after all. But even at this age, a man like Thomas Edison must keep working, must feel he is useful he launches what will be his last great scientific project, a search for a domestic source of natural rubber. I'm a little hoarse. I have a Michael that Uh, shall I go ahead now? All right. I'm very frequently asked by the newspapers for some definite news in regard to the results of my experiments and investigations for obtaining rubber from American-grown plants. So far, I'm feeling quite satisfied with the outcome of my work. I would like to correct the impression that I am working on synthetic rubber by stating that it is real rubber. I aim to produce no non-synthetic, and only for the case of emergency in the, where, where we might have war. Edison's health is excellent for his age, but slowly, inevitably, his great mind has begun to fade. Uh, uh, passe news, passe news, photo phone. Photo phone. Sir, they're all here. They're all here. As the years pass, Americans realize that one of the world's most creative men is still living in their midst. And more often now, Mrs. Edison speaks for her husband. Grateful to you all, and we appreciate everything that you have done and are doing for us. Thank you. In 1929, Henry Ford attempts to express his personal admiration and the public's deep respect. 
He plays host to the golden jubilee of the electric light in Dearborn, Michigan. It's an enormous celebration attended by the leaders in every phase of business and science. Ford has outdone himself in recreating Edison's past. The official party rides in an exact replica of the train on which Edison served as a newsboy 70 years before. Before a tremendous assembly, Edison recalls a past triumph. First words I spoke in the, the original phonograph. A little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its feet were quite as slow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. After this brief contact with an admiring audience, Edison insists on leaving the celebration. I'm tired of all this glory, he said. I want to go back to work. Edison drives through Detroit with President Herbert Hoover. The quiet crowd view the passing car with awed respect. Edison and his work have been an integral part of American life for more than 50 years. He is revered as the great benefactor the benign father of the scientific age. 1931. He starts a familiar journey to Florida for the winter. His strength is nearly gone. It is the last time he will make the trip. Seventy-two years before, a newspaper boy on a railroad felt the excitement of wheels and gears and chemicals and took a soaring pride in creating something new. And now, Thomas Alva Edison looks around him and finds everywhere a new world, shaped by his work, his will, and his vision. an ironic postscript to Thomas Edison's story. When Edison died, President Herbert Hoover conceived the unique idea to honor the great man. The entire country would shut off its electric power for one minute in tribute. But this idea, Hoover was told, was impossible. Electric light was too vital to give up, even for a minute, even to honor its inventor. It's a story Tom Edison would have enjoyed. Mike Wallace for Biography.